and welcome to our TLC Church podcast for this Sunday. This morning I have a very special guest sitting next to me. Some of you will recognize him as our very own Jerry Holmes. Good now, morning, everyone. <laughs> now, Jerry, I have a question for you this morning yep. um, to answer for all the lovely people watching at home. What is something that you have gotten to do during this most recent lockdown that you wouldn't have done if we didn't have a lockdown? Okay. Well, Joe and I went for a great walk up uh, Laura Mays Hill, and uh, we we tried it before, but um, it was too far, so we stopped and thought, ah, oh, it's too far. But this time, last Saturday, the, the Saturday that was sunny, so it might have been a previous one, we got to the top. And it was fantastic. That sounds lovely. I wonder if any of you have gone for a beautiful walk or spent more time outside than you ordinarily would have if you were following your normal nine to five, go to work thing every day. Now we're about to listen to a very special song. Jerry, can you tell us why you've chosen this song today? Yes, uh, I love Matt Redman and it's uh, his song but it incorporates the new every morning as well. Um, and it's set in Trafalgar Square. And back in uh, 2013, we had the opportunity, uh, Joe and I, to go to England, stay with our friends Rod and Vivi. And we went to Trafalgar Square. It was so cold that there was um, icicles on the, uh, on the statues. Um, and this song must have been a wonderful gathering. They came together and they sang this song live. And it's just so full of all the things we can't do at the moment, and it's a beautiful song. Great, thanks, Jerry. Well, let's start worshiping this morning with that beautiful song that Jerry's chosen for us. Faithfulness appears to me again Through mountaintop and valley, Lord In every season this I know Your goodness like the dawn will break again All your mercies rise in this heart again and my soul begins to sing They are new
Well, what an amazing reminder that song is for God's mercies, that he lavishes freely on us every new day, even when we're in lockdown. While it's disappointing that we can't meet together again just yet, keep an eye on your community emails for when we can expect to gather again. The TLC office is also not open at the moment, except between one and three on Tuesdays only, and that's just for Food Bank, and we only have a limited number of staff on site to help out with that. Thank you to everyone who's been giving generously as always through the offering. You can find the details of that in your community email, in the newsletter or on the TLC website. It's amazing how generously supported we feel even during such hard times when things are difficult for so many people in so many ways. So we just want to thank you for that and we'll be praying over that a little later in the service. Well, we're about to have a kids video. Last week, we watched the first half of the story of Joseph, according to Minecraft. And this week, we're going to watch the second half of that story and learn about the rest of Joseph's life. After that, we have one more song. This is one that Peter York recorded in quarantine last year with his daughter, Kira Lee. It's called Let the Kingdom Come. And it's just a reminder of God's amazing, steadfast faithfulness once again. There was a man named Israel, and he had twelve sons. Israel loved his one son named Joseph the most. Israel gave Joseph a colorful coat because he loved him so much. Joseph's brothers were jealous because Joseph was loved the most, so they came up with a plan. Hey, look, Joseph is coming. Let's throw him into this hole. Yeah. Wait, let's grab his coat and dip it in blood so that father thinks a wild animal has killed him. They gave the bloody coat to their father. Their father knew it was Joseph's coat and cried out, This is Joseph's coat, and he is dead! Meanwhile, some people found Joseph in the hole his brothers had left him in. They took him out and sold him as a slave to some passing merchants for twenty pieces of silver. The merchants brought him to Egypt and sold him to a man named Potiphar. Potiphar put Joseph in charge of his household. Now Joseph was very handsome and Potiphar's wife fell in love with him. 
Joseph ran away from her. She told lies about Joseph to Potiphar, so Potiphar put him in jail. The king, or as the people called him, Pharaoh, put his cupbearer and baker in jail with Joseph because he was mad at them. The baker and the cupbearer both had disturbing dreams and had no one to tell them what it meant. The baker and I both have disturbing dreams and we have no one to tell us what they mean. God can help me tell you what your dreams mean. In my dream, there was a grapevine with three branches. I took off some grapes and squeezed into Pharaoh's cup, which was in my hand. Then I gave it to Pharaoh to drink from. This is what your dream means. The three branches are three days, and in three days, Pharaoh will make you his cupbearer again. Now tell me the meaning of my dream. In my dream, there were three plates on my head, and all kind of baked goods in the top plate. But there were birds eating all the food out of it. This is what your dream means. The three plates meant three days. In three days, your head will be lifted, and Pharaoh will hang you in a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh. All the stuff Joseph said came true. Two years later, Pharaoh had a disturbing dream. The cupbearer remembered Joseph and told Pharaoh about him, so Pharaoh summoned Joseph. Joseph, can you tell me what my dream means? No, but God can. This is my dream. There were seven fat cows coming out of the Nile River, and seven small and sickly cows coming too. The seven small cows ate up the big ones. Your dream means that there will be seven years of good crop, and then there will be seven years of famine. And then Joseph said to save one-fifth of your crops for seven years, so that you will have food for the seven years of famine. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of the whole country to save food and store it up for the famine. When the famine did come, Joseph had the country prepared for it. The famine didn't just affect Egypt. It affected other countries too, including Canaan, where Joseph's family was living. Our family needs some food or we are going to die. I hear there is food in Egypt. Go, my sons. So Israel sent ten of his sons to go buy some food from Egypt. He did not send his youngest son for fear he would get hurt. When his brothers arrived in Egypt, Joseph recognized them, but they did not recognize Joseph. You did not come here to buy food. You came here to spy out the land. No! We are honest men! We all share the same father, and our youngest brother is at home with our father. Prove to me that you have a younger brother at home, and bring him here. I will hold one of you captive until you return. So, nine of the brothers went back home to get their youngest brother and return with him to prove that they were not spies. It was hard for their father to let Benjamin, his youngest son, go. When Joseph saw Benjamin, he got his servant to prepare a meal for his guests. When the meal was ready and his brothers were seated, Joseph could not control himself and shouted, I am Joseph, your brother. Is my father still alive? Then Joseph wept very loud, so loud that you could hear it from the house of Pharaoh. Joseph's brothers were shocked that Joseph was still alive. Pharaoh gave permission for Joseph's whole family to move to Egypt. Joseph was reunited with his father. Joseph's whole family moved to Egypt. If you guys want to know something cool, this is a true story. These events happened over 3,000 years ago. And if you want to learn more about Joseph's story, you can find it in the book of Genesis in the Bible. Hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll catch you next time. Here we are. This is a lovely place to be on a warm sunny day. We don't actually have a warm sunny day, we have a COVID overcast day, but it doesn't matter. Let the kingdom come, let the kingdom do Will it hearts to pay the price of love In the pain of life, in the joy of death Let the kingdom come As love costs our fear and trust can grow Let the kingdom come, let it come
With our songs of joy and peace Let the King come In our art and learning in trade and sport Let the Kingdom come, let it come To pay the price of love, the pain of night, the joy of day, let the kingdom come. We need good eyes to see who Jesus is, and good eyes to hear what Jesus said, and spirits to know the mind of God, and feet to walk where Jesus would walk. The king down come with the king down to pay the price of love, the pain of night, the joy of day. Let the king come with peace and justice and love and grace. Let the king come, let it come. Marriage, hope, and faith. Today is taken from James 2 verses 14 to 26. My friends, what good is it to say you have faith when you don't do anything to show that you really do have faith? Can that kind of faith save you? If you know someone who hasn't got any clothes or food, you shouldn't just say, I hope all goes well for you. I hope you'll be warm and have plenty to eat. What good is it to say this unless you do something to help? Faith that doesn't lead us to do good deeds is all alone and dead. Suppose someone disagrees and says, it is possible to have faith without doing kind deeds. I would answer, prove that you have faith without doing kind deeds, and I will prove that I have faith by doing them. You surely believe there is only one God? That's fine. Even demons believe this, and it makes them shake with fear. Does some stupid person want proof that faith without deeds is useless? Well, our ancestor Abraham pleased God by putting his son Isaac on the altar to sacrifice him. Now you see how Abraham's faith and deeds work together. He proved that his faith was real by what he did. This is what the scriptures mean by saying, Abraham had faith in God and God was pleased with him. That's how Abraham became God's friend. You can now see that we please God by what we do, not only by what we believe. For example, Rahab had been a prostitute, but she pleased God when she was welcomed the spies and sent them home by another way. Anyone who doesn't breathe is dead, and faith that doesn't do anything is just as dead. Here's an interesting question for you. If you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? It bears thinking about, doesn't it? Does enough of what we do demonstrate to those around us that we are followers of Jesus? Are we able, would, would we be able to prove that in a court of law? We're currently in our series, Living Out Our Faith, and today's topic is about faith and deeds, or sometimes referred to as faith and works. And now the book of James is famously known for this very topic. Um, just as in our reading today, James says, faith without deeds is dead twice. And he says, faith without deeds is useless once. And the whole book of James is really about this connection between 
our faith and our actions. And now the book of James was um, almost certainly written by James, the brother of Jesus, and it's probably the first letter that was written, probably written before 50 AD. And we know from the book of Acts that James was the leader of the Jerusalem church and that um, this book of James he addresses to the Jews of the Mediterranean diaspora. And he's probably addressing these particular topics because Judaism had become very much a, a religion of ritual and, um, and, and many felt did not reflect, that, reflect living in the way that the, the God of, of justice, love and mercy um, would want his people to live. And that probably followed over maybe into Jewish believers, those who'd come to faith in Jesus. And so James, um, they're, they're his flock, um, Jewish believers in Jesus the Messiah. And um, the, the, there's three main characteristics that I think are in the book of James. And, and the first one is that it has a lot of similarities with the Old Testament wisdom literature. And by that we mean the books particularly of Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and, and some others. Short, powerful sayings about life. For example, um, they both, both the Old Testament and James talk about the sins of the tongue, you know, what you say. For instance, in uh, Proverbs, it says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a grievous word stirs up anger. And James says something very similar here, and that's just, just one example. Another characteristic of the book of James is that um, uh, the Old Testament and James talk about the justice or justice and benevolence on behalf of the poor and disinherited or the, the needy and oppressed, um, the, the need to minister to the needy and oppressed. And both the Old Testament and James um, talk about the transiency of life, especially in connection with wealth, that your wealth will just be gone when you go and it, it just doesn't mean anything, that there's a folly in, a, in um, an obsession for wealth. Um, also, in discussing these things, um, James has more parallels than any other New Testament book to the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, so that's, that's very interesting as well, the, particularly you know, the ethics of Jesus as, as he expressed in the Sermon on the Mount. And much of this book is really short, pithy sayings and advice for living that possibly came from sermons. That's, that's what it's been suggested, that it came from sermons James delivered because it's kind of bitsy with very short sayings that it might be a collection of, of some of James's sermons. And why it could be sermons is he often speaks quite, quite powerfully in, in a quite a fiery way. He says things like, you foolish person, uh, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? That's the kind of thing you might say you know, in, in a sermon. Or in another place he says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with, with the world means enmity with God? So James is obviously a pretty fiery guy too. Um, but there's three things I think that James is really wanting to exhort believers to do or to make sure of. And those three things are, firstly, that our faith informs and controls everything that we do. Secondly, that our actions must match our words. And thirdly, that all of this is characterised by love, justice and humility. And I'll just say them again. That is that our faith informs and controls everything we do, that our actions match our words, and that all of this is characterised by love, justice and humility. So that's how I would kind of summarise all of these, all of the content of James. But let's break it down and just see what James is saying um, about uh, uh, faith and actions or deeds. Right at the beginning of, the pas of our passage for today, which is James 2, 14 to 26, um, he poses a question. He says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? And his answer, a few sentences later, is faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. I first just like to address there's a bit of a controversy about this, this when um, when James says, Can such faith, that is faith without deeds, save him? Um, some people feel that James is kid is contradicting um, Paul's teaching that salvation is by faith alone and not from works. And, and this has been the bedrock of Protestant and evangelical teaching ever since the Reformation. But I don't believe that James is actually um, contradicting this at all. We need to remember that James was writing this before Paul's letters and before he wrote things like he did in Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. These expressions that, that Paul wrote, although not necessarily at all the doctrines behind them, only became embedded as Christianity grew and developed. And ways of expressing salvation by faith alone can be so fixed in our minds that we can be a bit blinded to nuance or how, how some of these ideas can be applied in different ways into a wider picture here. And the same can be said for the word faith, um, that you know, we use faith in different ways today. We can use it to mean religion, you know, what faith group do you belong to? Um, or we can use it to mean a belief in something, like I believe, um, I have faith in the efficacy of the COVID vaccine, for instance. And in its kind of bigger picture way, the, the Bible uses it to mean faith in God's existence and his character, um, or it can mean faith in Jesus as God's son and all of that, mean, all of that means. Um, also, if we look at a wider use of, of the ideas of deeds and salvation, James also uses, it, uses the word to be saved in other ways. For instance, in, in chapter 1, verse 21, he says, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. So, you know, he, he might mean say, salvation to, um, a, might be referring to eternal salvation, but I think he also means um, being saved from, from a life that would just degrade you and not give you fulfilment. Or um, in chapter 5, verse 20, James says, Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. So he, he's probably talking, uh, using the word save and faith in a number of different ways here. And so we just need to, to look at those carefully. And what, so what is Paul saying then? Oh, sorry, what is James saying then about faith and deeds? Well, put uh, quite simply, I think James is saying that our faith must produce actions, deeds or works that reflect the teachings of Jesus, that reflect what our faith is in. What we do must reflect the, the, the thing or the person that our faith is in. Our deeds are evidence of what we say uh, we believe in. And if they don't, our faith is at best useless or at worst, um, uh, well, dead. He says that. It's a bit like a toy duck, isn't it? You can have a, have a toy duck it's shaped like a duck. It might even have a label on it that says duck. Um, but it won't quack or lay eggs or eat snails. It's just a lifeless imitation of a duck. It's dead. Um, but if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And if it doesn't quack like a duck, it's probably dead. I think that's the way... Um, James is using this. Well, he gives another illustration, uh, James does, in, uh, about someone looking in a mirror and walking away and they forget what was in the mirror. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. And James makes it quite easy um, right through his book to let us know what he thinks are the kind of things that we should be doing, the kind of things that should demonstrate our, that our faith in Jesus. For instance, he, I'll, I'll list some of them for you. He says, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is useless. Or in another verse he says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Or another he says, Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favouritism. Or he says, suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is that? Or in another verse, he says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's image. 
Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My friends, this should not be. Another one, he says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. So all of these things and many other, nearly all of them are actually come from the Sermon on the Mount. And something we need to remember too is Jesus was heavily invested in works and deeds. After all, he went around hearing, healing people, um, talking to them, caring for their needs, challenging oppressors and hypocrites. And even he said things like, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Or in another passage he says, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing and will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus even coined the phrase, practice what you preach. He was actually talking to the Pharisees and he said, um, he was talking about the Pharisees, sorry, and he said, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them around other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to help them. And Paul also um, supported the idea that our faith must produce deeds or works that are evidence of that faith. For instance, in uh, Thessalonians, um, he says, We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith your labour prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Or in another verse he says, With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power he might bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by your faith. So our faith in this um, transforming power of the gospel is something that should compel us to do things, to go beyond just that belief and to, to um, act on it, that our actions should come from that belief. In fact, I believe that our actions, actually the things that make our faith real, our faith isn't really quite real unless we do things with it. And, and um, uh, you know, when we act out, we, we get encouraged and strengthened by that and that, that increases our faith. Um, in fact, Hebrew tells us, doesn't it, that faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So faith is something we haven't quite grasped and until we make it real by doing something with it, it's not really real. It doesn't become real to us. It doesn't become embedded and part of our everyday lives. And this is what James is asking people to do, or pleading with people to do. He's asking it to make these things part of your everyday life so that your faith will become real. Um, and, and that way we can, it, it helps us to transform the world around us. I'd like to just finish with um, a verse that I mentioned before from faith, um, for, from James about this faith and action, where he says, But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, and by that he means the law as interpreted by Jesus, whoever looks intently into this perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in all they do. Amen. Good morning and, and thanks for joining us. We would like to spend some time now just praying for those in our community and bringing um, some pastoral prayers. Uh, there's probably others that you know of that are struggling and so join with me as we bring them to the Lord. Dearest Lord, we thank you that we can bring all things to you. And we just bring to you those in our community that are struggling now with um, surgery or waiting for surgery with ill health. And we pray that you would just encourage them. We pray that you would give them some patience and you would give them some peace as they just turn to uh, the medical people um, and teams that are taking care of them. We pray, Lord, for those in our community that are grieving, for those that have lost loved ones recently, particularly the Peel family. Uh, we also think of um, Elizabeth Faulkner's family as they hope to have a service um, and the thanksgiving of their life. And we just pray for these people as they process. 
and remember the ones that they love so much. We also bring to you those, Lord, that have really struggled in this last lockdown with anxiety and stress and depression. Father, we just pray that you would protect them. We pray that they would get the support that they need. We pray that your spirit would just calm them and, and take care of them, Lord. We ask for their families and those around them that support them, that you would give them wisdom, that you would also give them uh, patience and understanding as they journey with these people. We think of others, Lord, who are isolated, who are feeling lonely, for those who are struggling due to finance loss or to job loss and in, in many other things that have affected them during this time. And just bring them to you, Lord. And we ask that you would just care for them also. We pray that as our community, we might be able to support them and gather around them and encourage them. Lord, there's many others that come to us through Food Bank and for those that are living very precariously, the, the homeless, for those part of winter shelter, for others that are struggling. Um, Father, we just pray that you might meet their needs, that there will be kindness amongst the people that they meet and that they would be given what they need practically and physically as well as an emotional support. Father, we just really thank you for all these things and we lift these people to you. And for all those that we've not mentioned, may we be mindful of them and bring them to you. Now, Lord, we just want to thank you for the offering and we thank you for your goodness to this church um, and we commit all that is given to us. We pray that you will bless it, Lord. Pray that we will be good stewards of it. We pray that we'll be wise and discerning. And we thank you for the gifts that are given to us and uh, ask, Lord, that you would bless all that comes, that we might use it to glorify your name. Amen. Please join us now and spend some time just in your home um, sharing in communion as we gather in our own homes and bring these sacraments um, together. Let's pray. Dearest Lord, we just thank you so much for the gift of life you have given us through the blood that you shed in Jesus Christ. We thank you for this bread. We thank you for the symbol of the body that was broken for us. And we take this wine and remember you also, Lord, and for the blood that was shed. We thank you that we can spend this time in reflection and praise and thankfulness to you. Amen.
springtime and harmony. Of 
of today's service. Thank you for staying and watching until the end and I pray that it's been a blessing for you as you go out into the week and thank you as well to everyone who had a part to play in putting the service together. There's a lot of hard work that goes into putting together the video and the sound and the editing after all of the filming's done before it reaches your TV screens or mobile phones or whatever it is you're watching this on through the YouTube link. So we just say a big thank you to the team for putting all of that together every week. I just wanted to finish with a Bible verse from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, that speaks of God's faithfulness, which we've heard so clearly today through every song and through Pete's message and through the prayers. So I'll just read that for you now. The Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you. My prayer for you this week as you go into the week that you will feel strengthened and protected by God as you walk into whatever situation you know or don't know you might be facing this week. Can't wait to see you soon and have a wonderful, wonderful week.